Well, um, I'm Michael Sala. Um, I have a PhD in, in government from the University of Queensland and I've worked for a number of years in different universities. I had full-time uh, positions in the Australian National University in the Department of Political Science and in the American University in the School of International Service and had other appointments in uh, other universities such as George Washington University and also the uh, University of Queensland. Well, the question of my background is, uh, is an interesting one because what I was doing was working in international politics and I was very much influenced by uh, ideas and models for how to promote international peace and conflict resolution in the international arena. Um, and so over the years I did a number of things, uh, peacemaking initiatives uh, in East Timor, in, in Kosovo, I was able to put together a, a number of um, uh, grants and, and uh, workshops where we got people from these conflicts to come and talk and dialogue with one another, trying to promote peace. But what eventually happened was that I found that this wasn't being very successful, that um, my work in that peacemaking arena and also my teaching at, uh, at American University, uh, that I found was just not resulting in what I wanted in terms of um, peaceful outcomes to these international conflicts. So I began to look outside of the kind of conventional sphere. I began to explore theories for, for what it is that really is driving international politics. And so then I came up with this area of an undisclosed uh, extraterrestrial presence that is kept from the general public. So that really did help me understand what was going on and what is driving international politics. The question of how many races are visiting us is a really fascinating question. I mean, how can we know for sure exactly how many extraterrestrial races are visiting us or interacting with humanity? I mean, there are different sources um, disclosing some of that information. Uh, I, found, I found the most credible to be whistleblowers, people who have worked in these um, various secret projects who in some way have kind of being given information that gives them an idea of exactly how many races are, are here. One of those sources is a, um, a sergeant who worked in the, uh, for 22 years in the Air Force, uh, uh, Clifford Stone, um, and he was involved in these uh, top secret projects that involved the retrieval of crashed disks. So what his job was to go out with a number of other people from who were recruited from various military services that they would come together, uh, they would then be told to go to a particular location and they would then have the responsibility of um, sanitizing and retrieving whatever information and whatever physical evidence there is about a crashed extraterrestrial vehicle in different locations in the United States or elsewhere. And in that process he was able to get quite a bit of information on how many extraterrestrial races are visiting us. And he, he came up with the figure of 57. Uh, others have come up with uh, slightly more. Um, uh, another prominent uh, whistleblower uh, or uh, a former employee of, of the CIA is John Lear. So, so John Lear, he identified 60 races that are, that are visiting the Earth and he got his sources from uh, insiders within the CIA. So, so basically what we have is a picture of, of many different extraterrestrial va races that are, that are visiting us. Um, the precise figure is not clear because it seems that this may change over time, but what is clear is that a number of these extraterrestrial races have taken a direct interest in human affairs, in other words that they intervene in some way. And basically what I see is that this intervention takes two main categories. One is those extraterrestrials who directly interact with the government in some form, whether it's by agreements whereby technology is, is traded or whether it's uh, where information is, is given to the government and they meet with government representatives and exchange information for, for some kind of uh, reciprocal uh, benefit. And then there's another group of extraterrestrials who basically 
interact with humans, civilians, and uh, what they do is they're involved in these contactee reports, people who say that they were taken up on ships and, and given a lot of information and they're possibly even taken to other worlds. So there are quite a number of uh, contactee uh, testimonies that exist. And so what we have is a picture of, uh, of quite a range of extraterrestrial races who, who are directly intervening. In my own exopolitics research, what I, what I did was identified 17 races that are directly interacting with humanity. Um, six of those races uh, are making agreements with the government, uh, the secret government, either directly or indirectly where, they're, where they are part of this framework of agreements. And the other 11 races of extraterrestrials are those races that basically directly interact with civilians. Uh, they, the, they either do it through some kind of telepathic communication that, that's then followed by a kind of physical sighting of their ships or physical, direct physical interaction where they meet um, in person with um, individuals and then even take those individuals into their, sh into their ships and take them uh, off for um, trips into outer space or even to the home worlds. So, so there are those races. So it, it is very, very complex, quite a number of different races and uh, getting accurate information on this is the challenge but I think there's enough information out there to, to give us a, a reasonable picture that this is basically what is happening. It's the question of uh, just how much of this is really the missing element of international politics that is really not taken into consideration by people is a really interesting question. Um, I think that's exactly what's happening. It's, it's like when we look at the international political arena, people are focused on problems that they believe uh, really are going to be the things that need to be solved if you're going to promote international peace. But the thing is if you look beneath that there are a whole set of other problems that aren't disclosed and, and people are really in the dark about that. They don't know what these issues really are and so without that awareness you really can't solve these these hidden problems. And so it's like international conflict just keeps on perpetuating itself and that's really where I feel that there is a, an important need to, to let many in the general public know of, of what it is that is secret political dynamics. I've been trained to, to do scholarly work on the political actors and processes and institutions that are part of any conventional political uh, arena. And so when I look at this whole question of an undisclosed extraterrestrial presence, um, I came up with this concept of, of exopolitics, basically recognizing that we needed to look at this exopolitical dimension that is underlying international conflict. And so really that's what I put a lot of my um, research energy into. I, I committed myself full time to this because uh, I found that I just couldn't teach what I was doing before. Um, that teaching international politics or being involved in international political initiatives without addressing this hidden exopolitical factor to me was just a waste of time and, uh, and I really feel that time is short for all of us, that you know, we've got to make the most of our time here to do the thing that really we feel resonates with our, our, our inner truth. And so I basically uh, made the decision that I wouldn't work in the conventional international political arena anymore and I would work in this exopolitical arena. And so what I did, I basically did the research on a, a variety of exopolitical factors. Um, I did the research as I would any research topic in uh, conventional politics, you, you look at the sources, you try to identify, you know, what are the most credible sources, you know, who should you listen to, you know, should you listen to the whistleblower who says he or she worked uh, for the military uh, for X number of years and they saw this or they met these people or they saw these documents, should you listen to contactees or abductees, people who say that uh, they actually met with extraterrestrials, should you look at uh, remote viewers or should you look at these documents that are being released. So I mean these are all sources of information that from an exopolitical uh, perspective are very important and the thing 
from a research perspective is to try and rank them. You know, what is going to be the most persuasive? You know, is the most persuasive source of evidence going to be the sort of person who comes forward and says, well, I worked in the military for 22 years and for five of those years I was involved in a secret project. And in that project we actually got to work with some uh, retrieved extraterrestrial vehicles. We got to guard them or we got to uh, see how these can be reverse engineered. I mean, that kind of testimony, how important is that and do we give that the utmost priority or do we look at um, other testimonies like witness testimonies, uh, people who say that they saw uh, an, a, an, un, a, an unidentified flying object and, and kind of look at that and say well because we have multiple witnesses for this one event well that testimony is, is the most credible. So you know look at these sorts of uh, issues about you know how we are to rank and to factor in these different sources of evidence and basically once you've done that <coughs> And then what you have is a pool of data and from that you can draw an analysis and that's really what I do. I, I draw an analysis based on the sources of evidence that I identify and that I rank and I, and I see as the most credible and, and, and my analysis is, is based on that. Well, the question of the military-industrial complex and what that is doing is a, is a very fascinating one because you know, we need to look at the origins of this phenomenon. Um, I believe it began during the Second World War and there was recognition that there were extraterrestrial vehicles that were visiting our planet and also a recognition that uh, these extraterrestrials were somehow involved with Nazi Germany and that some of the uh, advanced technologies that the Germans had were a direct result of their communications or interactions with extraterrestrials. So I think what happened at the very um, beginning of this phenomenon, say in the United States, was there was a recognition by those in the policy making arena that extraterrestrials are real, they're here, they have these advanced technologies, so we need to set up an infrastructure to deal with that. And one of the questions that they had to answer immediately was, well, to what extent do we let the Congress in on this? You know, do we let the US Congress play a direct role in terms of oversight, in terms of being informed of what we're doing here, and therefore the general public plays a role because they of course elect uh, congressional officials and then it becomes part of the congressional debate in terms of you know, what, what the military is doing. Or should we keep the whole thing under wraps, keep Congress out of the loop because you know, the, uh, the, the national security implications of this are just so overwhelming that we need to maintain secrecy, we need to ma maintain uh, a hold on this kind of information so that it doesn't get released to the wrong people and then possibly compromise the national security of the United States. So I think what they decided was that they would create an infrastructure that would be totally secret, totally black. Um, no one within Congress would, would uh, be able to intervene or exercise any kind of congressional oversight of this infrastructure. And so then you, what, what happened was that this over the years continued to grow. I think uh, what we have with President Eisenhower was um, a complete reorganization of this secret infrastructure that was set up under the Truman administration and, and even earlier with Roosevelt. So that under Eisenhower this infrastructure grew and took on a much larger corporate flavour so that the corporations were then involved in a more direct way. And so then you did have a genuine military industrial complex. And because it involved an extraterrestrial component, because there were extraterrestrials who were making agreements where they were exchanging technologies and information to this, um, to this, uh, it's, to the civilians or to the policymakers in charge of this infrastructure. I describe it as a military, industrial, extraterrestrial complex. So that really is uh, a very large hidden infrastructure which is funded outside of the regular con uh, congressional appropriations uh, process. The CIA plays the key role in, in funding this uh, vast infrastructure and they do that through the 1949 CIA Act which allows the CIA to, to raise revenue without provision to law. 
So basically it's given carte blanche to, to raise money however it feels is appropriate and it can do that through the various different uh, agencies in the, in the federal government. Well, under the Eisenhower administration, there were a number of corporations that were brought into the vast infrastructure that was set up to deal with this whole extraterrestrial presence. And because there were extraterrestrials who had reached agreements with the secret government who were part of a trade of technology and were given basing rights and also began to do things such as experiments with, uh, with civilians, that what we have is a genuine military, industrial, extraterrestrial complex. And that complex is funded through the CIA. The CIA had the unique responsibility of raising revenue through non-appropriated uh, sources. In other words, that contrary to how a regular government agency operates where they get uh, appropriations from Congress and Congress has oversight in terms of how those appropriations are used and spent. The CIA Act was, was um, created in 1949 where it gave the CIA the unique power to raise revenue without provisions to law. So it meant that it could kind of go outside of the regular lawful process to do this. Well, the transfer of technologies uh, from extraterrestrial races that have reached agreements with uh, the secret government or the national agencies responsible for this whole extraterrestrial phenomenon uh, is really a fascinating one. Um, we know that there were agreements reached. Uh, we have a, a reasonable idea that this began uh, under the Eisenhower administration in 1954, that there was the first concrete agreement reached as a result of a series of meetings that Eisenhower had with extraterrestrials and uh, that these agreements then allowed for a number of technologies that the extraterrestrials had to be exchanged or given to the, to the national security agencies or to the Eisenhower administration in exchange for such things as basing rights where extraterrestrials could build bases in remote locations. For example, we know that uh, there have been some bases built in the, on the grounds of the Nellis Air Force Base in, uh, in Nevada that uh, there also are reports of uh, underground bases in, uh, uh, in places such as Dulce, New Mexico. So we have reports of these kinds of underground facilities that were made possible because of the agreements reached w between the Eisenhower administration and extraterrestrials. Uh, as far as the technologies themselves, uh, what technologies were exchanged, I think we get a good idea of that uh, from uh, some of the uh, whistleblowers who talked about some of the projects they worked on where extraterrestrials were involved. Uh, one of those whistleblowers is Charles Hall and he talks about how the extraterrestrials actually assisted the US government in developing the know-how for atomic powered space shuttles or vehicles that were based on the, the, the extraterrestrial sources or flying sources of the ETs and that these atomic powered shuttles were capable of making short trips throughout our solar system uh, such as to the moon and to, the, and to Mars in a reasonably quick time I mean, much more uh, much quicker than what we understand through conventional propulsion systems. So that kind of advanced propulsion um, device necessary for having vehicles travel regularly from the Earth to remote locations such as the Moon or Mars, that that technology was given to the government by extraterrestrials. Uh, we also know, for example, that the, that the uh, government has been working on anti-gravity propulsion systems and that a lot of this was, was given uh, or assistance was given by extraterrestrials. Uh, a captain, uh, a former uh, US Marine captain, uh, Captain Bill Uhouse, uh, then began to work for one of the corporations and he describes how when he was working for the corporations that when they were dealing with some of the challenges in terms of advanced propulsion systems that would be necessary for kind of uh, 
uh, interplanetary flight that an extraterrestrial would actually come into the meeting room where the engineers and the scientists were congregated discussing this problem. He would come in and would answer questions, would basically give them enough information so that the scientists could solve it for themselves. So it seemed that part of the agreements that were reached between the uh, Eisenhower administration and the extraterrestrial races was that uh, the extraterrestrials uh, would supply whatever technologies um, and also the information or the know-how for how to uh, utilize these technologies and even come up with uh, some new understanding in terms of whether it's physics, uh, atomic uh, propulsion systems, or whatever that technological area is. So it seems that there's a lot of evidence supporting the idea that there have been extraterrestrial technologies that have been given to the government and have been extraterrestrials have actually assisted the government in implementing these technologies and, and developing those. Well, one of the whistleblowers who has talked about the technologies that has been, that has been gained as a result of this interaction with extraterrestrials is um, Colonel Philip Corso. And he talked about a number of technologies uh, that were a direct result of this um, extraterrestrial information and uh, technology that, they, that the government had in its possession. And he does talk about uh, such things as um, uh, fiber optic cables whereby uh, you, you could have a lot of information be transmitted along these fiber optic cables using uh, photons and, and laser principles so that uh, a, a lot of information could be um, recorded in uh, fiber optics and, 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 and passed on to remote locations. So, so that would be the sort of thing that we rely on today with fiber optic cables, for example. Um, another area is the, the silicon chip, that this was something uh, that was a result of the kind of technologies that extraterrestrials uh, had supplied. Um, fiber optics, uh, uh, the um, high, uh, high textiles that were very durable like Kevlar, uh, uh, fabrics that are very strong and resistant to uh, uh, projectiles, that is also a result of this kind of uh, ex extraterrestrial technology that was, was handed down to the, to the military. And so, for example, the, the body armour, the Kevlar body armour that is used by the military, a lot of that owes its origins to the kind of extraterrestrial uh, information and the technology that was handed over. Well, one of the races that is really fascinating when we looking at this whole question of what extraterrestrial races are interacting with Earth is the reptilian race. Because what we know of the reptilians uh, by a number of uh, abductees, contactees and also whistleblowers is that there seems to be a lot of evidence supporting the existence of this race of beings on the planet for thousands of years. In other words, that uh, we might consider them to be an, an indigenous Earth species, an advanced non-human species that has lived on the Earth for thousands of years and actually may have played uh, quite an important role in the genetic manipulation or engineering which supposedly has happened when it comes to humanity. So these uh, reptilian races are a, a very significant factor in what it is that extraterrestrials are doing here. The indigenous reptilians seem to have a very strong interest in the biosphere of Earth being stable, that it's not uh, jeopardized unduly. And some who have kind of uh, analyzed what the reptilians have been doing or had some kind of interaction believe that this is because the reptilians view humanity as a resource and they don't want that resource to damage itself or damage the biosphere. So it's almost like um, the, the reptilians wanted to, wanting to get maximum kind of benefit from the biosphere being managed in a responsible way so that they could uh, reap the benefits of humanity as a kind of resource producing things that are of value to the reptilians. 
Uh, there also is evidence of an off-world reptilian race. It seems that reptilians have not just evolved on the Earth, but have also evolved on off-planet locations. And, the, and these off-planet reptilian races appear to be uh, much more aggressive, seem to be much more predatory, much more intent on establishing their own kind of uh, system on the Earth where uh, apparently they would like to have something that we would consider to be uh, a fascist uh, aut autocratic system that is in charge of the planet overall uh, for reasons that they argue is a, is a result of the kind of lack of responsible planetary policies that have been passed by humanity and that to remedy this you need to have some kind of fascist one world government put in place and it seems that this off world reptilian race is very interested in that and, and this is where you get uh, claims of a new world order being created because of uh, this kind of um, external intervention. Um, so overall the indigenous uh, earth based reptilians and the off world reptilians while they are have uh, very similar kind of physical characteristics and have a very similar approach to uh, wanting to manage the earth in uh, a responsible way so that humanity doesn't disrupt the biosphere. It seems that uh, there are some nuances there in terms of how much power would be exercised through proxies or elites that would be responsible for, for national policies on the planet. Well, one of the disturbing questions about this whole reptilian presence and is uh, in what way is humanity used as a resource. I think they're used as a resource in, in, in a number of different ways. I think uh, we're used as a, a genetic resource where our genetic material is used to um, somehow create new species, new hybrid races. I, I think uh, we're used also as a resource whereby our emotional energies somehow are used by reptilians for their own benefit. Uh, in other words, it seems that just as we require food sources to nourish our own physical bodies, these reptilian races, because they have uh, a slightly different kind of frequency, um, that they can actually feed off the emotional energies of humans, um, and th which is a, a very new concept for, for us because we, we don't think of uh, emotional energies as food, but it does seem that uh, emotions are a, s a food source for certain extraterrestrials such as the, such as the reptilians. Uh, as I mentioned, there is an earth-based reptilian race and they're generally referred to just as uh, indigenous reptilians. The off-world uh, reptilian race, uh, they're referred to generally as uh, reptilians from Alpha Draconis, so the shorthand phrase for those uh, is dr draconian, so that's what's used in the literature. So they basically view the earth as uh, as, a, as a planet that sustains uh, a human population on the surface which is uh, a resource for them. There are other extraterrestrial groups who are human looking such as the Pleiadians, the, the famous Pleiadians of Billy Meyer and, and others and they are much more intent on trying to assist humanity to um, become free of this kind of manipulation from other races that really try to use humanity as, as a resource. <laughs>
And so the, these short greys are the ones that are most involved in the abductions. They are the ones that play a leading role in uh, examining or conducting experiments on abducted civilians and in also playing a lead role in the creation of a hybrid species. That these short greys are, are the ones that uh, are, are carrying out a series of genetic experiments using civilians that is designed to create a, a hybrid race that is going to combine the superior intellectual energies of the greys with the kind of more powerful, nuanced emotional energies of humans. And it seems that what, what the short greys are wanting to do is to create a hybrid human race that is super intelligent by our standards with also a, a very wide emotional range, but not violent. It seems that they understand that the creation of a, of a very intellectually advanced hybrid race, if that race has this disposition to violence that humans have, that it would very quickly destroy itself and be a menace. So it seems that this is part of what the, the greys are doing, that they're doing a lot of research in examining human emotions because it seems that they want to create this hybrid race which has a, a wide emotional range but doesn't have the violent emotions accompanying that. When it comes to the tall greys, it seems that the, the tall greys tend to be more the policy makers. They tend to be the ones that are kind of like a diplomatic core of the, of the greys. They are the ones that make the agreements. Like we know, for example, when the Eisenhower administration met with uh, representatives of the, the grey extraterrestrial races, they met with tall greys. It was these tall greys who met with the military officials that implemented agreements. Um, but it's the short greys that actually carry those agreements out. So what we have is a, diff uh, a division of labour between the, the greys, the tall and the short. Well, the question of insectoid species, uh, they, there are a number of other species that are refer that are that do come up in the literature. Uh, one of those that comes up regularly uh, is the the praying mantis species, and they are supposedly around the seven foot, eight foot tall, who uh, look like a praying mantis. Uh, now, th this race is often seen uh, to be accompanying the the short greys, uh, so they seem to be a race that is also in one of these kind of uh, policy making positions. They are the ones that. Um, supervise the greys when they're doing their genetic experiments. Um, it, it appears from those abductees who have had some interaction with this insectoid race, the, the, the praying mantis, that the, the praying mantis tend to have a kind of very advanced genetic understanding or genetic technology, that they are also what appears to be a very spiritual race too, so they are very interested in, in developing a, a new philosophy, a philosophy of, of oneness, a belief in the collective, so kind of collective ideals where individuals subsume their own individual wants and propensities to the needs of the collective. So it seems that this is what the, the praying mantis and the insectoid uh, races more generally are trying to encourage a, a kind of a collective ethic whereby individuals subsume their own individual kind of drives and uh, concerns for the for the good of the greater whole. So that seems to be something that um, the insectoid species promote, which is very different to the human species such as the uh, the Pleiadians or other races like the Andromedans who have a much more individualistic uh, ethic. Well, the question of how does exopolitics influence government policy is, is really a fascinating one, and that's really where I'm very interested in, in how this all impacts on what the governments actually do. Uh, Iraq is a very interesting case because it seems to be confirmation of uh, what I found to be one of the, the, the chief goals underscoring foreign policy since the Second World War, which is to basically locate any extraterrestrial artefacts, any extraterrestrial knowledge, information, sacred texts that is located around the planet. So it seems that very soon after the Second World War, 
the major governments realised that what was going to be very important for them to be able to advance their own kind of infrastructures that are based on extraterrestrial technologies while maintaining a lid on all of this and ensuring that the general publics and the media and, and their own congressional um, uh, officials don't understand what is happening is to make sure that any technologies discovered in any, anywhere on the planet, that those technologies are very quickly taken into the uh, un under control of the national security agencies that are responsible for these extraterrestrial technologies and, and kept away from the prying eyes of the, of the mass media and, and Congress. And so when we get to a place like Iraq, what we have is a lot of evidence that what motivated the US intervention was not indeed a, a search for weapons of mass destruction, which is what the Bush administration claimed to be in existence, but in, in, in instead a search for exotic technologies, extraterrestrial artifacts that would somehow be a threat to the national security agencies that have been monopolising information on extraterrestrial artifacts and technologies since the Second World War. I think what happened really was that uh, the regime of Saddam Hussein came into contact with some of this information, that they found out that some of the ancient sites that date from the Sumerian era where it's well known that extraterrestrials did interact very heavily with the Sumerians uh, over 6,000 years ago, that those ancient sites did have one extensive um, documents or data on these extraterrestrials, so we're talking about cuneiform texts that recorded uh, those interactions with extraterrestrials, we're talking about cuneiform texts that had um, knowledge or descriptions of the technologies that these extraterrestrials use uh, that these extraterrestrials used, and then thirdly, you have uh, the artifacts themselves. That there was very likely that there were some extraterrestrial artifacts that were located in various places in Iraq, and as for what those technologies were, uh, it's, it's very possible that they may have included something such as the, the mythical Stargate, that kind of popular idea of. Uh, of a kind of interdimensional travelling device where individuals could move through one point in time and space to another point through a wormhole, that this was made possible by a kind of Stargate technology. And so this is something that I, I believe was very likely uh, an important extraterrestrial artefact that the national security agencies were seeking. And so they went into Iraq for that for that reason. And what I think helps kind of uh, give legitimacy to this kind of explanation is a recent study that was uh, commissioned by the US Air Force. It was called the Teleportation Physics Study and that study just came out a month ago. It was released for, for the general public and it basically verified that teleportation uh, is a real phenomenon. It actually does occur that physical objects can be teleported through a, a range of different mechanisms from one place in, t in, in time and space to another place in time and space. So this study looked at all of the literature and, and basically concluded that this is a very real phenomenon, that experiments have confirmed that teleportation is real. So what the teleportation physics study that was released um, this year confirms is that it is possible for s this kind of Stargate technology to exist and to actually be put into practice and I believe that uh, when we put all this together that we have a, a pretty compelling case that the US went into Iraq not for weapons of mass destruction but to get knowledge and technologies related to the extraterrestrials. Uh, we can say that first of all the, the Baghdad Museum was sacked pretty early on after the uh, the intervention. Uh, the, the US um, played a role in having whatever information that was taken out of the Baghdad Museum um, looked at and examined and I believe a lot of the cuneiform texts weren't returned. So a lot of the cuneiform texts that had this information uh, has been taken out of Iraq permanently and is probably now being translated and deciphered for the, whatever information it has on extraterrestrials and on extraterrestrial technologies. Uh, there are also locations in Iraq which continue to be under the control of the US military occupation forces. 
for example, ancient Babylon, where it's rumoured that uh, there was uh, a stargate located in ancient Babylon, that under King Nebuchadnezzar, that Babylon was where the stargate was finally relocated and hidden, that that is under the control of the US military forces and that uh, this is closed off. No one can go into that area. It's, it's basically military base. So this is uh, an ancient city, Babylon. So the question is, well, why does the US continue to have control over this kind of uh, ancient city when it, it doesn't in itself have a kind of military function? So why make the whole area uh, a, a base for, um, for, for US forces there? And then, and then finally, we can look at the, the, the way in which the occupation has been conducted. I think it was deliberately bungled. I think that this was not an occupation that was designed to be a short term, let's get in there, remove Saddam Hussein, remove the troublemakers from the regime and put in a regime that we can work with that will then put Iraq in a stable foothold. What they went in and they, what they did was they went in and deliberately bungled it. They bungled it in a way where they basically told the former elites that they were no longer welcome, that they were no longer going to be playing a role in the future governance of Iraq, that the Ba'ath Party was going to be illegal from then on. And so basically what that did was it created uh, the, the context for this violent insurgency that we're seeing, which is, continues to, to, to spiral on. And I think what that achieves is that it achieves a need for the US military presence to remain in Iraq because there's no way that the, the, the present Iraqi regime can contain this violence, can contain the, the insurrection because the people behind it are the former elites who feel that they were betrayed. They feel that they made a deal with the US, that they basically said, well, if you come in, we'll, we won't fight, we'll make a deal, we'll lay down our arms and we'll work with you. So the US came in, basically reneged on that, on that deal, said that we're no longer going to work with you, you don't have jobs any longer, uh, you're out of government and goodbye. So I, I think that those former elites felt uh, very disenchanted and very angry and so are now behind this um, insurgency and, and I, I believe this was, this, was seen, this was foreseen by the military planners. I mean, they bungled it deliberately and so the US will be there for a number of years yet. Well, uh, the question of Iran, what role does Iran play in these ancient artefacts? Um, a fascinating question, exactly what exists in Iran? Uh, Iran used to be uh, under the US sphere of influence uh, before the, uh, the Iranian Revolution uh, and it seems that the US may have actually played a role in the way in which the Iranian Revolution occurred in the first place. Um, what artefacts exist in Iran? Uh, very interesting question. It's an ancient uh, civilization that uh, was located there in Iran. Uh, very likely there was some extraterrestrial involvement. Hard to determine exactly to what extent, um, but certainly the Iranians do have ancient uh, cities and artifacts there, which I believe would be of great importance for the US in terms of being able to be in control of whatever significant repositories of extraterrestrial knowledge and uh, artifacts that remain in existence. And I believe Iran and Afghanistan are places that do have these ancient um, repositories of this information and technology. And so it would be in the US interest to get into Iran at some point. Now I think geopolitically it's very difficult for the US to do that because Iran is a, is a bigger state than Iraq and it would be very difficult for the US to simply repeat what it did in Iraq, in Iran. So I think they, they would have an interest in getting in there, but they're probably going to do it in a, in a much more covert way. Following the money trail is, is really fascinating because this is where I think we get strong evidence that this secret infrastru infrastructure exists and it's vast. I mean, how do we get this information? Well, we looked at the way in which money is funneled through different agencies within the, the US. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, the 1949, National, uh, 1949 CIA Act basically gives the CIA the unique ability to be able to raise revenue from other government agencies, federal agencies, without uh, provisions of law. So it basically means 
that the CIA can go to the director of the Housing and Urban Development and say, well, you've got, for example, $50 million in your budget earmarked for assisting low-income earners in getting, uh, buying their first homes. Well, what we'd like you to do is transfer 30, million, 30 billion of that into this secret account. And you basically come up with reasons for where this money uh, has gone, how it's being used. And, and you might have to fudge the books, you might have to kind of have improper auditing um, mechanisms, you might have to kind of silence people who ask questions about where, where's this missing money, how come it hasn't uh, funded the things that it was supposed to fund. You, you might have to do that, but that's your job because you're, you're the director of Harden, that's what you're supposed to do. And because the CIA has this power, uh, uh, it basically means that the directors of these different federal agencies need to comply. It's lawful. It's, it's actually part of the law that uh, the, the CIA can raise revenue through different government agencies without provision to law. So it doesn't matter that that appropriation, appropriated money was intended for low income earners. Uh, it now is going to be used to feed the black budgets that the, that, that the government that the CIA is, is, is funding. So the, the black projects that the CIA directly funds is what it's going to use all this money for, all this revenue for. When we look at how does this money come, it comes through different government agencies such as uh, HUD, uh, Veteran Affairs, Indian Affairs and so forth. Various agencies who have chronic problems in terms of accounting for all of the, all of the funds that uh, are in use through that agency. We have whistleblowers who have come forward to talk about how those agencies have had funds funneled out. One of the, pro one of the most prominent whistleblowers is uh, a former Assistant Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, uh, Catherine Austin Fitz, who talks about how there was this vast sum of money that was missing in, in HUD. And when she tried to uh, account for it, she found very quickly that senior officials in HUD were not at all pleased with that effort and that eventually as she got closer to accounting for where this mi missing money was going, she was eventually um, dismissed and uh, subsequently she worked for the Clinton administration to try to come up with uh, more transparent accounting um, of the uh, HUD funds and again had the same problem. At a certain point her company was then made subject to, to litigation and was forced into bankruptcy. And, and basically whatever it was that she found in terms of where this money was going, it was something that uh, she was not going to be able to make public. Her company was very quickly driven to the wall and she was discredited. And so what we see is a, is a pattern whereby um, whistleblowers who do have an idea of where this missing money is going uh, are themselves become subject of uh, very intense campaigns to silence them and discredit them and basically ensure that this information doesn't come out. So when you put all this together, I think that the main, inf the main kind of insight we can draw from all of this is that money, vast sums of money are being siphoned through these different agencies into the coffers of the CIA, which then forwards this money on to the DOD. And this money is funneled through the DOD and goes into the black projects which the DOD has direct oversight over. So the CIA is kind of like the bag man, it collects the money, it goes to the Department of Defense that actually administers how this money is going to be spent on different black projects. So the size, how much are we talking about? I think the, the best indication for just how much we're talking about here uh, are the auditing irregularities that the Inspector General of the Department of Defense has himself identified. He identified in, in three years, it was uh, 1998, 1999 and the year 2000. In those three years, we identified on average $1.7 trillion could not be accounted for in the Department of Defense budget. In other words, this was money that was, was being moved around in ways that could not be accounted for. And I think what that indicates is the true size of the black budget. We're, we're looking at an infrastructure that is funded by as much as $1.7 trillion a year. Now when you consider that the whole Department of Defense budget officially is just over $400 billion, we're talking about a, we're talking about a vast infrastructure that is four times greater than the entire Department of Defense budget. So we are talking about something so vast 
I mean, the entire U.S. federal uh, budget is in the vicinity of uh, 2.1 trillion dollars. So, if the, if the if the true black budget is 1.7 trillion, you you have a sense of just how vast this is. How can all this be covered up? Well, I think the, the, a system has been set up since very early on to do precisely that. I think one of the, one of the first things that the um, national security agencies did was that in 1953 they passed uh, a joint Army-Navy air publication called uh, JNAP 146E, which basically said that all information concerning UFOs would be would have to be reported to the responsible agencies and that anyone reporting this outside of those agencies, anyone, anyone reporting information on these UFOs that were currently under investigation by an agency was subject to penalties, severe penalties, $10,000 or 10 years jail. So this was back in 1953. So you can imagine $10,000 in 1953 is quite a sum of money as is the deterrent of 10 years in jail. And people were silenced. Uh, those that were investigating the UFO phenomenon, investigating the government conspiracy to keep all this quiet, regularly found that when they began to question uh, servicemen or people who had any information on UFOs, that these people would clam up because they would say, well, because of JNEP 146, uh, they, they've got to keep quiet because they don't want to be put away for 10 years in Fort Levensworth or kind of subjected to these funds. People are regularly intimidated. The whistleblowers that I have spoken to or communicated with all discuss different ways in which they have been silenced, uh, where, for example, they're, they're visited by uh, teams of, of agents, intelligent, military intelligence agents, and simply told to, to be quiet. That if they don't get quiet, that if they're not quiet, that they'll be harmed. That if they themselves don't have any fear of being harmed, for example, they're, they're retired, um, then their families will be harmed, that the careers of their sons or their children will be harmed. So, I, and I think that this is how they silence the whistleblowers. As far as the mass media is concerned, I think that there's been enough research done on identifying exactly how it is that the mass media is um, kept away from this whole phenomenon where uh, in collaboration with the owners of uh, the, the media conglomerates, uh, senior editors, that any enterprising journalist or who wants to discuss UFOs or anything concerning the, the cover-up or how the money is, is raised to fund these projects, enterprising journalists would find themselves uh, out on a limb. Um, for example, there's one journalist, uh, a former journalist for the San Jose uh, Mercury, Gary Webb, who in 1996 published a series of exposés on the CIA and the drug connection and how that money was being raised by the CIA. He found himself very quickly on, on the outer. He, he published this uh, these series of articles and then his newspaper basically uh, backtracked, apologised for this, for, for having a, gone forward with the articles in the first place. Webb himself was discredited and unfortunately uh, lost the kind of uh, uh, respect he in, once enjoyed in, in his profession and uh, unfortunately um, had basically felt compelled to commit suicide um, at the end of last year. So that was a very sad case but it gives you an example of the sort of financial desperation or, or the financial hardship that those who talk about these types of areas undergo. So through a combination of all of these different uh, mechanisms, whether it's physical intimidation, whether it's direct threats to family, whether it's harassment, whether it's um, uh, financial hardship that is experienced by these individuals, the silence is kept. And so this vast infrastructure is, is kept away from the general public.
Well, the question of how do we respond to all of this? I mean, what, what does this all mean for us in the general public? I mean, we know of a vast infrastructure, an extraterrestrial presence which, not, which isn't acknowledged, the government making deals with uh, different extraterrestrial races and, and keeping this away from the Congress and the mass media. What, what do we make of all this? What, does, what does it mean for us? Well, I think we need to be very, very concerned about this as individuals uh, who uh, obviously live in the, in the West, in the US, and with families that we're raising, and, and we need to look at, well, what does this mean for us personally? What does this mean for our families? And I think we need to be very concerned about the way in which this whole area has been managed by the national security agencies responsible. By ma maintaining secrecy, keeping people in the dark, it means that we really don't know whether this secrecy and withholding the information, withholding the technologies from the general public arena is really for the best interest of all of us. I mean, for example, we know that uh, there are technologies in existence that don't require fossil fuel energy sources. So we could replace fossil fuels. So the dependence on oil could be ended overnight. We could have uh, advanced technologies whereby individuals would have kind of unlimited energy by which they could do things such as travel um, from different parts of one city to another or across a country or even intercontinentally, that there could be unlimited energy for fueling their houses so that they don't have to pay these hefty energy bills during the winter. So there is very direct uh, consequences of, of, the, of these technologies being withheld. Also when it comes to medicine, I mean it seems that uh, extraterrestrials have uh, superior medical technologies that they could be shared with, uh, with humanity, with the general population. These also are being withheld, that this is being withheld ostensibly because if this information were released to the general public, that the general public would learn that this was not developed through conventional science, that this was somehow handed down by some advanced race, so it would blow the cover on the extraterrestrial presence. So in terms of our global health, we're also playing a very heavy price. We're also play, uh, paying a very he um, heavy price in terms of the economy, in terms of a vast infrastructure that has been set up and is secretly being funded through not regular appropriation channels. So it means that these uh, stories and the evidence we hear of the CIA being involved in uh, drug running and organised crime, uh, money laundering, um, and also taking uh, legitimate appropriated funds from some agencies to use for the for the black projects that this is happening on a vast scale so that means that the taxes that you or and other citizens and I pay that basically this is not used for the things that we think it's being used for it's being used for funding projects that we're not told told anything about and also it means that we pay a higher cost of, of living that we have a higher cost of living for everyday items and that's because a lot of the revenue that uh, comes through the taxation of uh, and, and the companies that, that provide for these services and these products, a lot of that revenue is siphoned off into the black project. So we pay a very heavy financial cost. And then there's finally the political cost. That is, you have governments that are forming agreements with extraterrestrials who are very advanced, mental, mentally advanced races who I believe have infiltrated these national security agencies. In other words, that officials in these agencies no longer represent the best interests of humanity, but are now representing the interests of a particular extraterrestrial race that they have been compromised by. So we, we pay a heavy price if we don't make this open, if we don't bring in transparency and accountability into this whole uh, process, it means that we don't know whether or not those that are behind the policies are actually implementing these policies for the best interest of humanity, which is what they claim, or for the best interest of a particular extraterrestrial race that may in fact be wanting to um, utilise humanity as a resource in, in a much more overt and much more aggressive way than has happened recently. So I think we need to be very concerned about what this all means for us. In terms of myself personally, uh, yes, I paid a price. I mean, I gave up a career in, in academia that had all of the benefits that any academic has in terms of a, of a position, a salary, a career, kind of respect from those around, around one to pursuing an area where I'm kind of shunned by my peers, where the, where the finances aren't there to kind of uh, 
maintain the lifestyle that I was used to before, where, where members of family or, or my network of, of friends are very puzzled about why I'm doing this kind of research that is so, so out of left field. So yes, personally I pay a price, but I think the price I've pray, uh, I have paid kind of is, gives me an ability to be able to risk the kind of intimidation or pressure that others succumb to because I've already paid the, the, the kind of the economic price for all of this. And so that can't be used against me. But um, certainly, yes, there's been a, a personal price that I've paid, and but I think it's worth it because ultimately we're talking about a world that I live in and the world that will be bequeathed to my children and, and to all our children. Is disclosure occurring now? I think that there are signs that it is happening, that there's an acclimation process that, that is underway. I think the very fact that I'm able to talk to you about this uh, is a sign that there are those within the national security agencies that want this kind of information to be disclosed. They want it to be done in a way that can be easily discredited or denied by them. So people like myself kind of fit that bill quite well because, you know, I don't have a, uh, a present position, an academic position at, at all. I don't. And so they could be, uh, they could very easily say, well, all this is, is just kind of made up or somehow contrived by my own need to create a, a new research field for my own kind of selfish benefit, uh, my own self selfish uh, benefits. So that's something that could easily be claimed by them. But at the same time, I get the information out. People go to my website, they read the information, they buy the books, they listen to the lectures, so they're getting the information. So I think the government is very happy to, to kind of do this balancing act where they allow the information to come out, but it comes out in a way where those releasing the information can be very easily kind of uh, are discredited or, or, or denied. Uh, you have whistleblowers like Charles Hall coming forward um, who have had significant interaction with the, with the um, extraterrestrials while service, serving with the military. So the, re the very fact that he can come forward and release this testimony I think is also a sign that acclamation is happening. And finally we have uh, uh, mainstream media starting to take an interest in this. I mean, Peter Jennings came out with his uh, special on February 24th, Seeing is Believing, which came out with a kind of um, a very balanced uh, perspective that on the one hand said that the UFO phenomenon is real, but on the other hand kind of uh, denied the reality of such things as uh, abductions, uh, UFO crashes and also didn't even bother looking at whistleblowers. So on, the, on the one hand it didn't do a very good job, but on the other hand it actually did present some very credible wit uh, witness testimonies that UFOs were real and that the government was not seriously pursuing this and, and that they were actually denying what was being seen. So I think that is a, a good sign that there is an acclamation process happening where the information is being released to the general public and the mass media is now kind of coming on board. So it's not just going to be through the alternative media, coast to coast or Jeff Rents, but it's now going to be the mass media that's going to release a, a kind of very diluted version of all of this information. But I think that's very encouraging. So we can be, we can look forward to the future uh, of, of one where more of this information gets out into the general public. Well, in terms of my own research and who has helped me the most, I think it's really the, the whistleblowers who have helped me the most because I think that they are very credible uh, witnesses. I mean, they saw things during their, uh, during their military services, uh, whether it was actual crashed disks, uh, the, re the retrievals that people such as uh, Clifford Stone saw during that 22 year service, or whether it was uh, secret uh, government documents such as the, uh, the assessment that uh, Sergeant Major Bob Dean referred to uh, when he was the, the supreme headquarters of the Allied Powers in Europe back in 1964, uh, whether it was that document or, or whether it's, uh, say, whistleblowers such as Charles Hall who have talked about their experiences with extraterrestrials where senior military officials accompanied them. I think having been able to talk to these people, verify uh, the evidence that they have uh, of this extraterrestrial presence, hearing what has happened to them in terms of government intervention with them to try and silence them or try to get them to uh, 
um, not release the information in a way that uh, threatened the, the, the cover-up. That has given me, I believe, rock-solid proof that there is a presence, an extraterrestrial presence, that is very real, that is being covered up, and that there's a lot of information that exists out there that has been released through these disparate sources. And so my job as a researcher is to really try to kind of um, come up with some way of evaluating these different sources. Uh, I, I have in my book, the, the first chapter there, seven sources of evidence, seven sources that I rank, and I rank the, the whistleblowers as the most reliable, the most credible. But you know, there are other sources that are also can be factored in. But when we look at all these sources and when we rank them, we can piece together all of that data, and there's a lot of data there. I mean, the, in the, the, part, the problem in the past was that people didn't know how to deal with the data. They either said, well, this is true or it's a lie. Well, it's not black and white. It's, there, there are many gradations in between here. And so what I do is try to kind of like look at the gradations, try and rank the testimonies, and then come up with a coherent analysis of all of this and, and put it out to the general public. And uh, I'm very gratified by the kind of response I've gotten where people feel that the analyses that I've come up with have helped them understand what's going on.